Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, on this presentation on HIPAA and an ACA update webinar, cheekily referred to as It's Time for Your Annual Checkup. Uh, my name is Mark Jane. I'm a senior attorney in the Butzel Long Ann Arbor office. Uh, I practice employee benefits, and I will be giving a, a, a brief update on uh, how the Affordable Care Act has impacted uh, certain group health plan setups. Uh, we also have Lynn McGuire, a shareholder in the Butts Along Ann Arbor office. She also practices employee bene benefits, and she will be providing uh, HIPAA updates for plan sponsors. And last, but certainly not least, we have Deb Giroux, who, a senior attorney in the Butts Along Bloomfield Hills office, who will be uh, speaking on uh, the importance of compliance programs. Uh, I'd just like to start off by saying, uh, feel, please feel free to answer questions during the presentation using the GoToWebinar question panel. Uh, we will attempt to answer your questions at the very end of the program. Uh, if the, should there not be enough time, we will reach out uh, personally to answer uh, your questions afterwards. Uh, also, the PowerPoint of this presentation will be available after this uh, uh, webinar, so uh, please ask if you would like a copy of it. And we are attempting to record this, uh, and it will be posted online uh, on YouTube for people to review. Uh, there will also there will also be a link to our website uh, to the YouTube link. With that, with that being said, let's uh, begin. I want to. Uh, my part of the presentation is on how the IRS at the end of last year uh, kind of gave an early New Year's present uh, by releasing a about a 30-page document. Uh, about how the Affordable Care Act impacted uh, group health plans. And I wanted to touch on three of those uh, updates because they affect uh, several group health plan structures. And uh, going forward, uh, if you are creating a new plan, it's something to be in mind now. Uh, but there are also transition rules. If you have plans that are like these designs that I'm going to talk about that Starting in 2017, you'll probably be, you'll need to be mindful about how they're going to impact uh, how these Affordable Care Act uh, provisions impact your plans. Uh, the first of those is on health reimbursement arrangements. Uh, as a brief background, a health reimbursement arrangement is an employer-funded defined contribution health plan. It's usually uh, provided to employees uh, to pay for medical expenses. Uh, it's not like a flexible spending account, which is usually funded by or which is usually paid for on a pre-tax basis by the employee. Here, it's all employer money. Uh, there are several types of health reimbursement arrangements: uh, retiree-only health reimbursement arrangements, and those that are for like dental or vision coverage. Those are health reimbursement arrangements that are not subject to the Affordable Care Act. The ones that are are for active employees, and that is where the Affordable Care Act guidance by the IRS comes into play here. Specifically, the, IR, the rule that's been in place for a couple years now is that standalone health reimbursement arrangements, being standalone means they're not paired with anything. It's, it's something that uh, the employer is just providing to employees uh, for active employees. Those generally do not comply with the preventive service and annual limit mandates of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Thus, if you provide a standalone health reimbursement arrangement uh, for, each, for each participant that's in those arrangements, that's $100 per violation. So that's actually $200 a per day because it's actually two different mandates that are at issue. In order to comply with the Affordable Care Act, those health reimbursements arrangements must be integrated. Now, I'm not going to go into what, what integration is in depth, just to know that in integration, there are two types. One is where minimum value of the, of the group health plan that it's paired with is not required, and another in which minimum value is required. But in general, integration is where the health reimbursement arrangement essentially supplements the group health plan coverage. So what did the IRS say? Last year, the IRS said that an HRA will not be integrated with self-only group health plan coverage provided by an employer 
if that health reimbursement arrangement reimburses the medical expenses of an employee's spouse or the employee's dependents who are not covered by the group health plan. So basically, if an employee elects self-only coverage, the HRA cannot reimburse the spouse or the dependent. The HRA will only be considered integrated if the spouse and dependents are also covered by the employee's group health plan. There is, it is likely that the IRS, based on prior guidance on health reimbursement arrangements, would consider an HRA to be integrated if the employee is covered by the group health plan of the spouse's employer. Now that's kind of tricky because you think that, okay, the employer is allowing the HRA to reimburse the employee and the employee's spouse and dependents, even though the employee's not covered by the group health plan. But in previous guidance, the IRS has said that an HRA will be integrated as long as it doesn't matter what, what the health coverage is that it's integrated with. So in this instance, if the, if the employee is covered by the spouse's group health plan, the employee is not electing self-only health coverage. Thus, there's no viol it, it is likely there is no violation of uh, the Affordable Care Act in that instance. And there's a, I put out an example in the PowerPoint for, to spell that out. There is transition relief, as I mentioned before. Uh, for plan years beginning before January 1, 2016, an HRA will be treated as immigrated or integrated even if it reimburses expenses of family members not enrolled in the employer's group health plan. But going forward, at the moment, for plan years beginning before January 1, 2017, the agencies will also treat an HRA as integrated if the HRA would otherwise be integrated based on its terms as of December 16, 2015. So essentially, if you had an existing HRA on December 15, 2015, you're okay until January 1, 2017. It's at that point that you're gonna need to uh, comply with uh, this IRS guidance. However, if you're creating an HRA after December 15, 2015, so starting on 2016, or starting December 16, 2015, you're gonna need to comply with this. You cannot provide uh, HRA reimbursements based on self-only group health plan coverage. The next two things I wanted to get into are interrelated and they have to do with cafeteria plans. Now, as many of you probably know by now, the Affordable Care Act requires an applicable large employer to provide affordable minimum value coverage to its full-time workforce or be subject to a pay or play penalty. So, and remember, there's two types of pay or play penalties. One is when you do not offer minimum essential coverage to at least 95% of your full-time employees should you be an applicable large employer. And remember, that is one in which the employer and its controlled group, so basically uh, parent subsidiary or companies, uh, if there are more than full, 50 full-time equivalent employees, you'll be considered an applicable large employer and you would have to provide minimum essential coverage uh, to your full-time workforce. Or you, if any one full-time employee receives a premium tax credit from the marketplace, then you might be sub you'd be subject to the penalty. The second type is if you actually do provide minimum essential coverage, but it's not considered affordable because somebody in your workforce ends up not taking your coverage and gets a, or a full-time employee goes out and gets the premium tax credit because they couldn't afford. Now, what is affordability? It's tied to how much the employee is required to contribute to, now this is important, self-only group health plan coverage. Now, where do cafeteria plans come into play? Cafeteria plans are frequently structured to provide either opt-out cash for employees who waive group health plan coverage, so or flexible credits that may be used to pay for non-healthcare benefits or may be received or may, may be cashed out. So maybe an employer provides flex credits that can be used for the group health plan or for vision or for the flexible spending accounts, dependent care or health care. In those instances, uh, the Affordable Care Act is triggered and at least the IRS guidance from last year. So the first type is that I want to discuss is on how opt-out cash affects affordability. If the cafeteria plan provides opt-out cash in addition to a salary reduction for health benefits, the opt-out cash is added to the employee's required contribution. So essentially, 
imagine each month an employee makes a pre or for the year the employee is going to have a $100 pre-tax deduction for health benefits uh, or in the alternative should they waive that coverage they get $100 so what's the IRS looking at here the IRS is looking at the employee is paying $100 pre-tax for the coverage but they're also foregoing the ability to get a hundred dollar opt-out each month. So the cost of that coverage is actually two hundred dollars a month, not one hundred, because it's not just it's the pre-tax deduction plus what they're foregoing in their opt-out cash. Now, if you have a cafeteria plan that does this, again, there is transition relief until 2017 to be able to uh, maybe modify your cafeteria plan. Uh, the opt-out cash benefit or to adjust how much your act the salary reduction contribution will be for the cafeteria plan. The second part is on flex credits. Now this is kind of interrelated because if a flex credit is used but it can be used to pay for non-health coverage like in, I made in my example dependent care uh, flexible spending account, the company is not allowed to treat that flex credit as reducing an employee's required contribution for health coverage. Uh, the only way that a flex credit can actually be used to reduce the health coverage is if it may only be used for health expenses. So thus, if an employer gives $1,000 of flex credits and those $1,000 can be used for numerous things, including being cashed out or for uh, non-health benefits, like a dependent care flexible spending account, that $1,000 will not reduce the amount of the required contribution for health benefits. So that's something to be kept in mind when you're doing your affordability calculations. Again, if for existing plans that starts in 2017, uh, if, you, if you're creating a cafeteria plan with a flex credit as of right now, you'd need to comply with this provision in order to uh, have affordable coverage. Now that's my part, I wanna turn it over to my colleague, Lynn McGuire, to speak on HIPAA updates. Thank you, Mark. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining us on such a snowy day. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about what's new under HIPAA for group health plan sponsors. And then I'm going to go over a few things that are kind of, um, you know, things that I think might surprise some employers. We all have this idea of what HIPAA requires you to do. Um, but I just wanted to um, go over a few, few things that you might not understand. First of all, what's new under HIPAA for group health plan sponsors? The big thing is hackers. Hackers now prefer your health data. They want your health data more than they want financial data. And I've included some um, headlines that were recent headlines to kind of, that kind of prove this point. Hackers are getting in everywhere and they're getting into the most secure systems that you could imagine. They're really after your health data. And this is something you need to protect against. The question is why? Why are they so excited about health data? Well, the answer is it's lucrative. Um, unlike your financial data, which has a limited lifespan, there is a much longer lifespan and a, a much bigger market for health data. And for example, your financial data, once you figure out that somebody has hacked your credit card, you shut off the credit card, and that makes their data worthless. So the hacker is selling data that has a very short lifespan. They can't sell it for as much. But if the hacker can get your medical records, you're not gonna be, be able to change your social security number very easily, or it'll take you longer to figure out that your medical records are being um, um, improperly used um, because you're really honestly not reading your um, explanation of benefits um, every time they show up in the mail, likely. Um, and it takes you a while to figure out that somebody is using your, um, your health plan in a way that wasn't intended. There's a huge market also for health insurance fraud purposes. If someone can get access to your um, insurance information, uh, they can sell it for a big markup. So just a little background here so we all know what we're talking about in the group health plan context. An employer-sponsored group health plan is considered a covered entity under HIPAA. That means you have obligations. And similarly, any service provider to the group health plan is considered a business associate, and that means they have obligations under HIPAA as well. Now, your obligations, just very generally, are that both you as the covered entity and the business associates that you retain, you have to adopt and implement policies and procedures to prevent, detect, contain, and correct security violations. 
So essentially, this requires you to be proactive um, to keep the hackers away from your group health data. Now, from a practical standpoint, what, it, what are you as a plan administrator going to do to stop um, people from getting to uh, information in the hands of a business associate that you hire? It's not like you're going to go out to your security or your service providers rather and check their security firsthand personally. You basically have to rely on those service providers to ensure that um, they are adequately protecting and securing your, uh, your participants' health data. So that's created a new standard given the, the rise in um, healthcare fraud and healthcare data theft. The new industry standard now um, is that you should be adding to your service provider agreements an obligation on the part of your service provider that they will perform risk assessments, not just risk assessments, but risk assessments that meet the standards of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And they've created a special publication 800-39 that sets out some very specific standards that are designed to uh, cut off access to people that are trying to improperly use your data. Now, a risk assessment is basically what it sounds like. Someone goes through a system and checks all the weak points in the system to figure out where someone can access it where they're not supposed to. And this doesn't necessarily mean it's an electronic system. It could be a paper system as well. But essentially, if this service provider is performing a risk assessment that uh, meets this higher standard, it will give you a measure of protection that your participant's health data is secured. So if you add this requirement to your service agreement, and you also require them in their service agreement to provide you copies of those health risk performance uh, risk assessments, at least annually, you'll have a measure of um, um, assuredness that they're doing what they're supposed to do and what they need to do to protect the data. Another thing that we'd recommend now that you add to service agreements is that you add a provision that makes them liable for damages if they fail to properly perform a risk assessment every year. Now, similarly, if you have somebody that um, signs a business associate agreement with you, if you can add this provision to their business associate agreement, you'll get an additional uh, layer of protection as well. So you'll have contract rights against them, as well as having a provision in there requiring them to do something um, in a representation that they're essentially making to the Department of Health and Human Services. So now let's kind of talk big picture again. What is PHI? What is the protected health information that we're securing here? It's essentially any information that relates to an individual's past or present or future health or their condition. And that's whether it's physical or mental. It's information that pertains to past, present, or future payment for the provision of healthcare services or the actual provision of those healthcare services. If that data identifies or which you reasonably believe someone could identify who that individual is. And if the information is also created or received by a covered entity, you as the employer, um, uh, plan administrator, or one of your business associates. So that's what we need to protect. And now I wanted to kind of go over a few examples that might surprise you of things that aren't PHI. So you have to have this big system in place for protecting PHI. These are the places where that system is not going to uh, apply to you. Here's the first example. Information about the employee's past, present, or future health condition is not PHI if you as an employer obtain it in your role as employer rather than as plan administrator. So here's a quick example. An employee tells the supervisor he needs some time off because he's got new antidepressant meds and he needs to get used to them. That's certainly something that sounds like PHI, but it's not because the information uh, was provided to the employer and not to the plan administrator. That said, the employer is still put on notice that there may be a potential FMLA claim or an ADA claim. And if that employer uses that information to uh, put into place any adverse employment action, you know, a hiring, a firing, demotion, um, pay cut, those things could come back to haunt the employer. You can't, still can't discriminate, even if it's not PHI. So general privacy concerns still apply. Here's another instance of something that's not PHI. If the information is provided by the employee rather than by the health plan, it's provided to the plan administrator, but by the employee. So say, say an employee tells a supervisor that her back pain requires her to take five Vicodin a day. Again, the employer has information in its possession that came from the employee um, 
but it didn't come from the group health plan. So this is not PHI because it was provided by the employee, but it does put the employer on notice of a potential ADA claim. In the next example of something that's not PHI that might surprise you, it's not PHI if there's no way to figure out who this individual is. And the example here is a group health plan gives the employer a report. So it comes from the plan. And the report shows that 16 out of 400 of the employees in two states covered by that plan have in place prescriptions to obtain medical marijuana. Now it came from the plan and it's talking about PHI, it's talking about um, medical services provided to this individual employee who's a participant in the plan, but there's no way to figure out who those 16 people are. So there's no way for you to figure out who the party is, it's not PHI, and hey, you can't figure out where the party is either. The next example is a group health plan enrollment data set. Employers worry about these obsessively. They've got a data set of employer enrollment data. They've got to do something with it. They've got to get these people enrolled. They've got to let their payroll people know what to do with this enrollment data. But it's not PHI in the hands of the employer. So if it goes from the group health plan to an outside party, it is PHI and the HIPAA protections apply. But if the employer is providing it, it's not. So for example, if the employer enrolls himself and his spouse in coverage, and then also elects coverage for five children that he fathered with five different women over the past two years, that's not PHI. You don't have to worry as a plan administrator, but the employer is on notice that this guy might need a little time off coming up. He's gonna be pretty tired. Now, before the employer can obtain PHI from a covered entity for employment purposes, so before the employer can turn to you as a plan administrator and say, hey, um, can I have some information? Um, the employee or the job applicant, depending on who you're dealing with, has to give permission. And I've listed some examples of situations where the employer might have a real need for information from the group health plan. He can get it, but not without permission. The plan can provide the employer the enrollment and disenrollment information that we were just talking about. It can also provide summary health information that can be used uh, to modify your plan, to figure out plan design changes, to terminate a plan, to get bids for premiums, or, um, or to set your premiums. And the plan can also provide the employer PHI for enrollee, enrollees in order to perform administrative functions. But the plan must first obtain a sponsor certification that the plan was amended to restrict the use and disclosure of PHI including for employment related actions or for use by another plan like your disability plan, for example. You can't trade information back and forth between the health plan and the disability plan without this plan sponsor certification. All right, um, that's the last substantive example I've got for you. The last thing that I have for you that might surprise you is that now after the high tech, am high -tech amendments to HIPAA, individuals have the right to share in civil monetary penalties. Now, what does that mean? It means your employees now have a financial incentive to figure out that there was a HIPAA violation and to rat you out. So that's just to put you on warning that there are substantive reasons here for why you need to make sure you have a HIPAA compliance program in place and you're following it to a T. And that kind of segues into the next speaker, Deb Jury, my colleague here, is going to start talking about compliance programs in general and HIPAA compliance programs also. Thank you, Lynn. As she said, I'm going to be focusing initially on general compliance and then segue into why you need a HIPAA compliance program as part of an overall business plan. So why comply? I already have a compliance, and pro compliance program in place. Or for those that don't, here's the answer. This is just a little oversight of the healthcare industry that I like to show to different boards so that they understand the importance of why having a compliance program is a good business tool. As you can see from here, and this, this, obtain, this pertains to the healthcare industry, but you'll note that a lot of the entities that are listed on here, which are governmental entities, courts, and the, the like, will apply to virtually every employer out there. So why do we need a compliance program? For those of you that don't have one, or even those that do and don't really understand why, the most prevalent 
is it makes good business sense. As Lynn indicated, employees are becoming more astute. Consumers in general are becoming more astute and more proactive. There's increased enforcement activity, which I'll discuss shortly. And it's highly recommended through various regulatory agencies. I've used the Office of Inspector General for the Department of HHS, Health and Human Services, as a guidance here. Um, the other reason, though, is that for many industries, it's required. And again, I'm going to focus my portion on the healthcare industry, but any regulated industry is going to have some aspect of compliance that's necessary. So what is a compliance program? We're going to start at the basics for those of you that don't understand the concept. Compliance program is a management system for preventing inappropriate conduct within an organization. What it does is it provides guidance and support across the organization for the employees to make appropriate decisions regarding both clinical and business practices, decisions and behaviors. So where it all began, the United States sentencing guidelines that apply to corporations as in the criminal context. So adopted in 1991 and significantly amended in 2010, the US sentencing guidelines provide leniency for entities that adopt compliance programs. In most instances, if it is an effective compliance program, and we'll get to that soon, that was in place at the time of the potential criminal conduct that's being investigated, it will result in a two-point departure, which equates to lesser penalties for corporations. Why I like to look at the U.S. sentencing guidelines is because the Office of Inspector General for HHS implemented the elements that the sentencing guidelines have in place for 12 industry-specific compliance guidances for healthcare providers. So again, the basics of an element of an effective compliance program, and this is a floor, not a ceiling, is that there are written policies and standards or codes of conduct. There is a designation of a compliance officer and special counsel, effective training and education, effective lines of communication, enforcement of standards through publicized disciplinary guidelines that are consistent and even-handed, regular monitoring and auditing internally, externally if you need to, responding to detected offensive, developing corrective action plans, and last but not least, conducting regular risk assessments. Now this is something that they claim to be new under the Affordable Care Act, however I will submit that risk assessments have always been required. And I say that because with the U.S. Sentencing Guideline, an effective compliance program is one that is monitored and updated as necessary. This right here are some of the important um, items that we saw on a compliance front that came across over the last year. In addition to the U.S. Sentencing Guidelines, we have what was called the Yates Memo that I'll get to in a moment that discusses corporate criminal and civil investigations and prosecutions, um, new DOJ compliance counsel, settlements and fines and the like. So let's get into it. I already have a compliance program. Why do I need to update it? For those of you that have a compliance program, they're only as effective as they are utilized. So under the U.S. Sentencing Guidelines, effective in the government's eyes is one that is periodically assessed to determine the risk of criminal conduct and have in place appropriate steps to design, implement, modify, and address any risks that you see in your industry. So we now have the Yates Memo. For many years, the Department of Justice has issued guidance to its attorneys in terms of prosecuting corporations in the criminal context. Well, in September of 2015, U.S. Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates issued a memo to the DOJ personnel highlighting the importance of individual accountability for corporate wrongdoing. Previously, corporations took the hit and their individuals, the CEOs, the presidents, 
usually got out of any criminal liability. Not any longer. According to the Yates memo, corporations have an enhanced obligation to provide the Department of Justice information about the individuals that are responsible for corporate wrongdoing. That is a predicate to receiving the cooperation credit that I discussed previously under the U.S. Sentencing Guidelines. Right here is the requirements that are part of the directives to the Department of Justice. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see that it really pertains to the corporations doing all that it can when it finds an issue in determining what the issue is and taking measures and how and who the DOJ is going to prosecute for this and taking it out of the hands of the Department of Justice attorneys to a limited extent. So the impact of the Yates memo is a policy shift. Now the focus on corporate cooperation with investigations is going to include a focus on individuals at the inception of the investigations. You're less likely to obtain immunity for individuals, even if the corporation pleads. And as an example, I have here a fairly recent case, an indictment that was handed down in October of 2015 regarding the president of Warner Chilcott, where the company had pleaded guilty the day after this came out. Obviously, it had been through an investigation for healthcare fraud, but they received a two-point reduction for cooperation, and that was tied to the indictment of their president, who was said to be the force that had implemented the sales strategy that violated the anti-kickback statute and forfeiture laws. So we also see in 2015 DOJ hiring a new compliance counsel. The announcement that the compliance counsel was going to be hired came about in July of 2015. And in November of 2015, the DOJ announced the appointment of, of Hugh Chen, who was a federal former prosecutor, as well as a former senior in-house compliance officer for two major financial companies. And in November of 2015, the Assistant Attorney General Leslie Caldwell issued a announcement that set forth the DOJ metrics for an effective con compliance program that Hu Chen and her office will be looking at. And this is the categories of what they're going to be looking at in terms of what is an effective compliance program. And it's broken down into oversight and visibility, clarity and training, and accountability or enforcement. So let's look at the oversight and visibility. That is what we would deem a culture of compliance. What they're going to be looking for is that there's a tone at the top of compliance, a strong commitment from the board down that is both visible and explicit in terms of its requirements, rewards, and punishments. It also, on the visibility front, means that the, there is a compliance team that not only has adequate stature, meaning it has a direct line to the top, when issues arise, but also have adequate funding and the resources necessary to carry out what is needed. So on the clarity and training, the directives of Attorney General Caldwell identify a number of different predicates or elements. The first is perhaps the most obvious, that there's policies and procedures that are in writing and accessible to all. They need to be understandable. They need to be regularly reviewed and updated, addressing the evolving issues that pertain to your particular industry. They also need to be translated, meaning that if you have a workforce that has individuals that are non-English speaking, it needs to be translated into their native tongue so they can understand it as well. It also needs to be accessible, both the program itself and the individuals that are responsible for carrying it out. The privacy officer, for example, in a HIPAA covered entity organization. And then education, regularly conducted of all employees. That's your CEOs and your lower level employees, as well as third parties. They have to understand that you are not going to put up with lapses in the law by your third parties, and that there will be ramifications should you learn of them. 
And then finally is the accountability. And like I mentioned before, this involves rewarding good behavior, punishing bad behavior, even handedly so that your CEO is treated no different than your mid-management. And holding third parties accountable. Like I said, if they are not following the law, you should not have boilerplate language in a contract that has no teeth. If they're not following the law, you need to terminate that relationship. As the DOJ warned, leniency on higher level employees will not be tolerated. Not only does that send the wrong message to the employees, but to the DOJ itself about the company's true commitment to compliance. So 2015 was a monumental year for Medicare fraud through the efforts of what are deemed the Medicare strike forces, both criminally and civilly. This here is just a little background on the, the Health and Human Services Medicare fraud strike forces, which were initially established in 2007 in the nine areas that I have indicated on the map, one of which is local to us in the Detroit regional area. Some of the statistics for the strike forces uh, this is as of September of last year. There have been nearly 1,400 criminal actions, nearly 2,000 indictments handed down involving over $6 billion in fraudulent funds billed to Medicare. And then in 2009, the DOJ came in and joined efforts with Health and Human Services, announcing the creation of the Healthcare Fraud Prevention and Enforcement Action Teams, or HEAT, Medicare Fraud Strike Forces, which is an effort to combat health care fraud around the nation. So far with the HEAT Strike Forces, there have been seven national takedowns since 2009. Nearly 700 individuals have been criminally charged throughout based on these takedowns with schemes involving nearly $2.2 billion. The most recent takedown, as most people might have heard of, was in June of 2015. It was the largest healthcare fraud takedown to date involving 243 subjects with $712 million alleged in fraudulent billings. The takedown covered a three day sweep around the nation involving 900 federal, state and local law enforcement personnel and covered 14 different states. You'll see here that some of the focus areas that they were looking at were Medicare Part D prescription fraud, Medicaid personal care services fraud, and home health fraud, as well as other schemes involving DME. At the same time these takedowns were going on for criminal prosecutions, we also saw an uprise in CMS taking action on their own right and suspending billing privileges under the Affordable Care Act Authority of Medicare and Medicaid providers. This here is just a press release about the Michigan takedown, which involves 16 individuals, including six physicians. And I just want to lead into one more slide of other efforts that we've seen across the country in terms of aggressive healthcare investigations, prosecutions, large fines, and, and sanctions one of which was a bribery involving diagnostic testing where 37 individuals entered guilty pleas. Uh, just October of 2015, the DOJ announced False Claims Act settlements totaling more than $250 million with 457 hospitals based on a national investigation into implantable cardiac defibrillators and hospitals. As of, and I should note that since October of 2015, another 57 settlements have been announced re revolving, involving, excuse me, the ICD investigations. So compliance in the ACA and mandatory compliance programs. If you're a healthcare provider and if you participate in the Medicare program, chances are that you have a compliance program mandate. And I realize that this is a little bit more tailored to the healthcare industry than to the HR and the covered entities that are online, but it's a good showing of what a compliance program needs to entail. Um, CMS has had significant advances with the assistance of the OIG 
in tailoring what they deem to be a good compliance program. And I would suggest anyone interested look at what CMS has put together. A couple things that I should say, though, is, and this goes across all lines, is that if you have a compliance program, there has to be training on that on an annualized basis, as well as updates to the program on an annualized basis to address those areas that have been found to be risky in your line of business. What is risky? Every industry is going to have their own risks, but I would submit to you that if you're wondering what is happening in your industry, look at the DOJ website to see who's been prosecuted, see if there's any like industries to yours, and see what the issues were and find that as a starting point to see if that falls within your organization as well, because that would be one point of a risk area. This here just gives a, an example of what the continuum of fraud, waste, and abuse is from the government's perspective. Um, there is a continuum from the ne mere negligence, errors, incorrect coding, and, and whatnot, to the more intentional fraud, billing for services not rendered. And I, I raise that because there is also under the False Claims Act what is deemed a reverse False Claims Act that is one in which you have identified an overpayment from the government but failed to return it is no different than submitting a false claim to the government. And in the Medicare and the healthcare field, this has some significant um, litigation and regulation going on because under the Afford Affordable Care Act, CMS said that when you identify an overpayment, you have 60 days to return it. Anything beyond that is deemed a false claim under the FCA. So there's been some uh, recent cases and regulations issued on when that 60-day period comes into play. And in August of 2015, the first case that we've seen, Kane versus Health First Inc. out of New York, shed some light on when an overpayment is identified and when the 60-day period starts to run. And in that case, it was determined that identified means that a provider is put on notice of potential overpayment rather than the moment when the overpayment is conclusively ascertained. Still not clear, but a better understanding of when someone needs to start doing something because you don't have to have a some certain before you start paying it back and know for sure that there is or is not an issue with the payment. In February of this year, CMS issued their final rule on an overpayment and when it's identified for purposes of the same 60-day payback. And in their terms, it's when the person should has or should have, through the mean, the exercise of reasonable diligence, determined that the person has received an overpayment and quantified the amount of the overpayment. Again, a little bit more insight, subject to some argument as to what is reasonable diligence and what is quantified. So now we get to the nuts and bolts of what everyone here is probably curious about, HIPAA compliance. Just like a general compliance program, HIPAA compliance is an aspect of that. And as Lynn mentioned earlier, every covered entity and business associate is required under the HIPAA regulations to have a compliance program in place. The compliance program is really going to be no different than the general compliance program that I referenced earlier. It's just going to be targeted to HIPAA regulations, healthcare aspects, PHI, and the like. So, one of the things that I, I really want to stress in this discussion is the risk assessments that Lynn touched upon earlier because they are a mandatory aspect of HIPAA compliance and one that people are not taking seriously. And I say that because in 2014, the Office of Civil Rights, which is the entity that is charged with enforcing HIPAA for Health and Human Services, completed their phase one audit of 150 covered entities. And in that, they determined that, for purposes here, two-thirds of the entities that were audited did not have a complete and accurate risk assessment in place at the time of the audit. Now, that's 
not only telling, but when you look at what has been happening recently and the lack of risk assessments that have been uncovered in HIPAA violations that have come down and settlements related thereto, you understand the necessity of having a risk assessment done, which is part of an overall security risk management cycle. So this is where being stagnant does not pay. The security risk management cycle, as I've depicted on here, shows you that you have to start with an inventory of where your PHI is stored. Do you have it on jump drives? Do you have it in a network? Who has access to that? So you need to have an inventory of where all of your PHI is stored and understand where the issues can lie in accessing that. And then you have to understand the significant threats and vulnerabilities. Once you've done that, you determine if the controls that you have in place are appropriate. And then assess the likelihood of harm and the rate the risk. So you're going to have a 1 through 10 list of what your risks are, high, high to low, so that you can start addressing those. And that's when you come into the, com the completion of the circle is creating a compliance documentation and management reports that address those risks and issues that you found. Once that's done, we start the cycle all over again. This is your annual analysis. And as daunting as that sounds, a lot can be said that there is no excuse not to do it. In 2014, the OCR issued or implemented the Security Risk Assessment. It is an online tool that is free to all users, and it goes through all of the steps that are necessary in doing a risk assessment. It is time consuming, but it is free, and it can be done internally or externally, and it's designed to help smaller providers make sure that they are on track with the assessments. So this is just another issuance from HHS about the importance of having annual assessments done. Like I indicated earlier, there were some notable HIPAA settlements that were based on the lack of risk assessments being done. The most recent was the University of Washington Medicine, where a $750,000 settlement was imposed for failure to, appropriate, to have appropriate policies and procedures to prevent, detect, contain, and correct security violations. One of the issues that they found there was that the breach that had occurred could have been caught had a regular risk assessment been performed and the education completed. As OCR Director Jocelyn Samuel said in that case, an effective risk analysis is one that is comprehensive in scope and is conducted across the organizations to sufficiently address the risks and vulnerabilities to patient data. Triple S Management Corp. is another example of a settlement, this time a $3.5 million settlement, um, where compliance included a Non-compliance included a lack of risk assessment, and a mandatory compliance program was imposed in that case. And then the cancer group, cancer care group, also had a $750,000 fine imposed, again, emphasizing the importance of a risk analysis and device and media control policies. So before we end, I do have to say, for those of you that are not familiar with the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, this is something that you need to put on your radar if you are an entity that makes calls and by calls that could include facsimile uh, correspondence to patients and consumers. Under the TCPA, which has been around since 1991, consumers are protected from unwanted calls and the invasion of privacy. We all know that. We've seen the do not call registries and things like that. However, in July of last year, a declaratory ruling was issued by the FCC that recalibrated the rights of patients to privacy and the need of covered entities and their business associates to communicate with their patients with respect to healthcare messages. Now, I'm not going to get into all the nitty gritty details of that. I would just suggest that if you are contacting your patients via telephone, even for for reminders for appointments, you need to look at the TCPA and conduct yourself accordingly for non-marketing and marketing messages that you have or have someone on your behalf send out to your patients. 
So what are the takeaways for compliance generally and compliance in the HIPAA world? Compliance is not a notebook to keep on the shelf. It's a part of doing business. It's a means of adapting behavior to ever-changing mandates and industry threats. And an effective compliance program is a preventative measure that incorporates risk assessments in a regular business practice. I'm going to put out to you that I mentioned earlier that there was a phase one HIPAA audit. Right now, we are getting ready for the phase two audits, which is going to be broader in scope and less invasive because OCR, if they don't need to, are going to do this as a desk audit. But for all covered entities, which I would propose is everyone listening to this webinar, need to make sure that they are in compliance because if OCR sends you a letter saying you are being audited, they want to see a snapshot in time as of that date. There is no get the audit, do it, and send them what they want. So I would suggest that if you do not have a compliance program, and especially one that is a HIPAA compliance program, that you do everything that you can to get up to date. HHS provides a good oversight of what's necessary by virtue of looking at the protocols that were in place for the phase one audit, which is available on their website. And I've listed a number of different resources, which includes the Office of Inspector General, as well as HHS and OCR at the bottom, which is the privacy resources. And with that, I will turn it over to Jonathan to see if there are any questions or comments from the audience. Okay. Uh, well, first, thank you everyone who attended today. Um, and also like to thank our three presenters today. Um, if you do have questions, uh, please go ahead and post them to the questions panel um, here at GoToWebinar. Um, we did get some questions during the webinar, so I'll throw these to our speakers and get their two cents. Uh, the first question that came in, um, I think came back around Lynn's presentation. Um, the question was for a small provider entity to perform a full NIST risk assessment is a gargantuan task. How realistic is it to do a full risk assessment and do you have any advice on how they should approach that? Oh, good question. Um, essentially, when you're dealing with a business associate um, that's in the business of doing this, I'm afraid it's just going to be one of the costs of doing business going forward in this you know, computer environment. Um, the risks of not meeting the higher standards of compliance are going to outweigh the cost of running this, um, this performance check, this um, systems test. Um, so unfortunately, um, I, I think it's just going to be a cost of doing business going forward if you're a service provider. Um, and, and, you know, essentially, if you do at least the minimum of the requirements on the standards list, um, you'll have set the bar at a higher level than what's currently required. And if I, this is Deb, and if I can just chime in, for those of you that are concerned with the cost of doing it and the, as you said, the gargantuan task of doing it, I would really recommend you looking at the tools that are available on HHS. The SRA, the Security Risk Assessment, was designed with these concerns in mind to make it much easier to do. Unfortunately, it's a requirement. And when you look at that, you're going to see that there are aspects for security that are required and those that are addressable. I'm going to put out to you that addressable doesn't mean optional. You still have to meet what the objective is. You can just do it on your terms. So hopefully the SRA will be a tool that everyone can use given the what the ginormous task that is associated with doing so. Thank you. Actually, that answer seemed to trigger another question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> could you recommend any resources um, that employers can use uh, to get their HIPAA compliance requirements in order or other tools? Yeah, actually, there, there are two that I mentioned during the presentation. One is a security risk assessment. Um, and that it, it's a nice tool if you look at it because it will go through each specific requirement under the regulations. It will tell you what's required and give you an idea of how you need to adapt your behavior. 
again, it, it, it's time consuming, but it's not as time consuming if you were doing this on your own. There are firms that are out there that can do these assessments for you. We can do them here. The other thing that I would, I would recommend is look at the protocols that are in place for the phase one audits on HHS's website. Um, that does give a number of good pointers in how you need to look at what you have and see if you're meeting their requirements. What was that link in the presentation? People could see that it, link. It is. If you go to HHS's website for OCR, and it, it's www.hhs.gov forward slash HIPAA, H I P A A forward slash index.html. On the left hand side, you will see a section that says audit. Um, and if you click on that, it will lead you to the audit protocol. Um, and then you can go through that. If anyone has any questions, by all means, my contact number and email is up there. So I'm happy to field any other questions that you have with respect to the HIPAA protocols. If I could just sort of follow up on that as well. Um, an another um, piece of the HIPAA compliance for plan sponsors is that you have to do training for people in HIPAA and you have to keep the training up to date and keep records of the training. Um, so you should be having your privacy and security officer participate in training and anybody who's listed in your policies and procedures as a person who's going to be handling PHI. Um, you should have them do training and document the fact that they did it and when they did it. There are a number of companies, you can just Google um, HIPAA training online and you'll find dozens of links to companies that for very, very reasonable fees will provide the training for you and document it for you. Uh, additionally, if you're interested, our firm can come out and do a presentation to large groups of people or we can do it through a webinar for um, you know, populations that are across different states, if that's helpful, um, to educate people on their uh, HIPAA compliance. Thank you. Well, it looks like we're at the end of our time. Um, as always, our contact information is there on the screen. Um, please feel free to shoot any of us uh, an email if you have questions that come up after you, know, you review the materials. Um, I received a lot of requests for copies of the presentation. Um, I will make sure that a copy of the presentation is up on the event page uh, on butzel.com uh, for people to download. Um, and I received some emails personally. I'll be sure those folks get a copy of the presentation. And we also recorded this webinar, um, so that recording will be available as well uh, for you to view. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining today. Um, drive safely out there. I hope the roads are better. And thank you, presenters. Have a good day. Thank you.